Hello everyone, this is Courtney Britton with the Texas Wildlife Association. Thank you for joining us for today's Wildlife for Lunch. Our topic is Rainwater Harvesting for Wildlife, presented by Billy Niffin, Water Resource Specialist for the Texas AgriLife Extension Service. The Wildlife for Lunch series is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and the Texas AgriLife Extension Service. Today's Wildlife for Lunch webinar does uh, qualify for one CEU credit for the TDA for the Pesticide Applicator's License. Um, if you would like to receive CEU credit, you must attend the live webinar. Unfortunately, viewing archived webinars does not qualify, but you must be on today's live webinar. You must complete the post-webinar survey. Um, at the end of today's webinar, when, you, uh, when we close out of the, the session, an automatic window will pop up that has the survey in it. And in that survey, you must provide us with your name, address, and either your applicator's license number or your driver's license number. So you may want to look around and make sure you've got one of those handy so that at the end of today's webinar, you can provide us with that information. Uh, once we get the webinar completed and we compile all the data, um, I'll send that information off to the Department of Agriculture, and I will be emailing out um, CEU certificates um, in about five to seven days. So you can look for those in your inbox. Okay, and with that, Billy, uh, this wraps up my session. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter, and uh, you can start with your uh, with your uh, presentation. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, excellent. Uh, very good. Well, my apology for uh, being slow this morning. I'm in Seattle where the weather is uh, terribly hot over here. We is in the 60s this morning and expected to get into the 90s, which would break records for them. Uh, trying to make sure that I can advance in the slides, and uh, so far I haven't got that done. Uh, so let me see how I can move that forward, uh, make sure it goes forward. Uh, Up at the top, the little um, blue arrow that's right next to the box that says 001 Rainwater Harbor. Um, I'm not. Billy, do you see the toolbar like that has the the circle and the highlighter and the eraser and all those things? Highlighter. Yes, I do now. Okay, all just right. over to the right. Okay. Let's see if this is a. The the last little button on that and that toolbar is it, there's a little box that says zero zero one rainwater harvesting and to the right of that is the is the advanced slide button. Okay. Uh, I don't have that on here so Okay, I let me just try find it. So okay, okay, just a second. Let me let me take it back for All a second right. here and Okay, you may have to advance these for me because I don't now. I, now I see that I have it now. Okay. Okay. Let me, let me right. try one thing. And okay. Are you able to advance it now, Billy? Let's see. I can. Okay. Now we see we're on we're on the third slide now. Right. So I'll okay. move back. Okay. We'll start uh, the last slide anyway. And my apology again. Um, not familiar with this, but the first slide was uh, at uh, our house where I live and my wife live. Uh, we have uh, hummingbirds. Those hummingbirds have been drinking rainwater. Uh, the only water we have at our place is rainwater, so that's what I provide for the wildlife of the hummingbirds uh, as uh, we ourselves as wildlife there. This third uh, slide here is of a, just a very simple, that's a two-gallon two water jug that a gentleman takes and uh, dips into his rain barrel. Uh, pulls it over and has it dripping in this little basin just to provide them for birds at that location, just to give uh, a sense of uh, providing water for wildlife. We can move from there into a little larger system. This just has a metal roof where it's got a gutter attached to it and runs right off into a water trough uh, that's open all the time. Uh, the problem with that, we get some evaporation with that, that if it goes down then I don't have any backups to storage, but it does provide then for that small red watering uh, device there at the bottom that was uh, either made for hogs or for horses. Uh, back on the left side of that uh, red uh, con 
container is a float that is protected then from walleye from, from bothering it or then uh, disturbing it. Uh, then from there, we can get into much larger systems. This is off of a larger roof, where we've got a 1,000-gallon collection tank, uh, not necessarily perfect, but runs into another water trough. This is one designed for sheep, so it's dug them down about one foot uh, to get it uh, at the ground level. But catching off that roof, running into that storage tank, uh, and then moving into there. So that's sort of where we can move from there, get into larger systems that's been constructed. Uh, this is one that's built in the 1960s uh, in far west Texas, really for the reintroduction of the bighorn sheep. One of the earlier ones that was uh, constructed, running into a large metal container and a homemade uh, float device to provide a very small location for water uh, for wildlife where they could drink there without a lot of evaporation. And so as we start looking at the industry, it's, it's grown and we can do that on our own location depending on where I live. What much, how much area I have then to provide for wildlife, which ones I'm trying to reintroduce or introduce are then to provide water for at my location, whether it's just going to be my backyard or going to be one large acreage that we may have, either on a, a wildlife or a ranch uh, or then some other location. When I'm looking at then providing water for wildlife, I need to look at the whole habitat. What does it take then to survive, to provide for a wildlife so they have everything that they need. Uh, first thing is certainly shelter that we got to have. They got to have a food supply. They got to have space as well to be able to move and travel. Uh, and then they, we've got to have some source of water for them. And whatever is the most limiting factor, that's going to determine how many or what species that I might have here. Just as a rain barrel that might be just a filled up a portion, wherever that bottom hole is, that's going to be the level that I can attain whether it's going to be in wildlife species or wildlife diversity that I might have. And so looking at that, making sure that I provide everything for the habitat for those species is going to be very important. Uh, so, and I jumped to number two for some reason. I didn't intend to do that. So, uh, and I'm not sure that's what I needed. Uh, but uh, we, let me, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, this is uh, going back to the, limiting factors that we might have. Uh, we've got wildfires that's taken place. We've destroyed then the habitat for some of these species. Uh, so it's more critical as we start looking at from uh, areas that's been burned, that we've lost the food supply, we've lost the cover, and the other things are water is one of the things that we've got to supply. Then under the drought that we're in now, that we can start looking at then a number of areas that uh, that stock pond, that creek, that spring has dried up. Uh, we may have lost that water supply then for certain species of wildlife. And so we need to add that as a supplemental farm then take care of our needs. So going back to the requirements there, first thing we've got to have is we've got to have a food source for these uh, species to live there. Uh, and it's going to be different for each one. When we start looking at the habitat requirements for deer uh, and the food source that they're going to require, it may be different then from a fox or then some other species of wildlife. And that diversity of plants is important. We've got to have food 365 days of the year, not just a certain time. So diversity of plants is very critical as we try to meet our needs uh, in all this process. And so going back and looking at those things, diversity is extremely important that I provide for all species as well the diversity of species that I would like to have. So every plant is important, uh, every food source is important for them. Uh, just looking at deer, they will adjust their habitat or their food supply based upon what they have available to them or what they will eat based on that. So we're looking at certain seasons of the year, looking at here where there's lots of forbs, lots of, uh, woody, lots of weeds that are out there, they will shift their diet primarily to them uh, versus then browse plants that may be more uh, available to them during the drier time of the season or then during the winter time. So they'll shift their diet to that. So having that diversity of plant, again, provides that time and that food source that we need. So diversity is, in good, is important for all species there. Next is looking at cover and having a variety of cover and needs for that. Uh, looking at birds, they got to have an area there that they need to nest, uh, as well as raise their young for different species of wildlife. So they have that cover and protection for them during that time. Cover from then uh, the elements, uh, the weather conditions that they may have, where it's going to be hot, they need to have that shade, need to be able to protect them as well during the winter time. And then protection from predators just as important as well, so that they feel safe and comfortable being at any one location. So 
so that's important that we have then that that cover for them, uh, and it de and it varies depending on the target species that we're working off of. Next is space, and it doesn't take very much for that cottontail rabbit. Uh, I've had one that just stayed at our house, and we had a beagle dog, and every time we drive up. Uh, they both knew what their job was. A rabbit was to run around the house. A dog was supposed to chase him around. Once they've done that, then they could go back to their spot and be okay. But looking at a white-tailed deer or looking at a mountain lion and looking at the different species, I've got to have them the space for them to be there uh, and then be able to stay there. And so that's going to vary with species. And so some of these, it doesn't take very much. Others are going to take lots of space for them uh, to feel comfortable. And then lastly is looking at water supply that's going to be needed for them. And they get water from three different forms. One is going to be that free form of water where they may be able to drink out of that uh, uh, jug that I may provide for them for my hummingbirds, or they may be then a pond or, or then some other source there that I may provide for them. But they're also going to get water from the vegetation. As we start looking at vegetation, it has water in it. Uh, we look at some of the real leafy grasses that they may be 30, 40, 50 on up during the wet time, during a really immature growth, it may be 60, 70, 80 percent moisture. And so they may not need any other supply of moisture than that. A quail may be able to drink a drop from then the dew early in the morning, so they, that may be their only need for that free form of water. And then uh, looking at the vegetation that they eat, that seed or that uh, red ant or those other things that they may be consuming, gives them that extra supply of water. But then as they digest foods, as we break down some of the carbohydrates, then off of that is going to be water as one of them, uh, the, the ingredients that is broken away or then provided for them, those different species of, of, of wildlife or birds, or then insects as well. So they're going to get it from vegetation, not only the inside of that plant itself, uh, the amount of water that it has in it, but then also then the nectar uh, that it may provide for them as well. So these plants, as these uh, uh, birds are then animals, then digest food, that breaking down of that is going to give water that may be their only need. Because there's been species that live in a desert may never have had a drink of then free water. But having that for many species is very, very important. Just as this white-winged dove needs that water because it's going to eat primarily real low uh, water level in seeds more than anything else that that's going to be very little water in it, they're going to need then that free form of water to provide for their needs. And so having that, and then even though they may not require that, they will enjoy being able to get there and then get to that water. So we may be able to supplement that water needs for them. That's very critical in certain areas where water, again, may be the limiting factor for wildlife, and I need that form of water to provide for them. But I also need to understand that any time I provide for one species that may be my target, then I'm inviting all the other species to come there and enjoy the water as well. So that's something we've got to look at uh, from a species we're targeting, but also understand that everything would like to have a drink of water. So as I look at it, uh, then providing water then just to attract wildlife, and this is one of the things that I enjoy sitting out in my yard and, and looking out and watching the birds come to that bird bath or over there where I have a watering uh, feature there that the, all the different sized critters. I may see a squirrel, an armadillo, or a deer go over there and drink. And so providing that supplemental water, it's going to increase in the usable habitat for wildlife. There are areas that uh, in one location where we had a 400 acre high fence, uh, only in one corner was there any water supply. So putting in a wildlife watering device on the opposite side then expanded that habitat that was usable then for those species of wildlife that need water at a, at, at a lower, at a shorter distance away from that one watering device to the other. Then attracting additional species of wildlife and birds that come to your place. Uh, where I have a watering device, I'm now able to identify birds that I did not even know existed in our area. I see those different uh, uh, birds that come there that uh, enjoy the water supply. I have a pond that uh, they can go to, but they just like and are attracted to that dripping water uh, and will come to it at my place. And so I'll see lots of different varieties that come there and enjoy then that uh, free form of water at my location. Then it increases wildlife number and diversity that I might have there. So I attract then uh, more animals can live in that. So my, my habitat then that lower end of it, if that's water, then I am able to support more animals as well as more animals may come to there simply because I've got more 
uh, of their habitat needs by providing that water. And it can be one of the wildlife improvement strategies as I start looking at then the wildlife tax evaluation that I may have on my property. One of those requirements may be then providing supplemental water. So then capturing rainwater and providing that location will give you that tax advantage or then one of those requirements to provide for that tax advantage. Now looking at how much water I uh, need or how often do I need to have water, when I start looking at animals, how far they will travel, then I need to make sure I have one uh, for, for them. We're going to be working on one in uh, Sandia Mountains in uh, New Mexico in October. Uh, there, there's three miles away from any source of water. Uh, they're wanting to reintroduce uh, pronghorn antelope to this location. So providing water at a, at a lower uh, distance or less distance from the other water supply then will increase their habitat. Their white-tailed deer have not then been able to utilize this area as well because it's just too far away from water. So looking at them, the distance that's going to be required, looking at larger animals, they can certainly move about half a mile or a mile or even further than that when you start looking at a, a male white-tailed deer. But uh, having that water for them is certainly going to let them travel less, uh, then they burn off less energy than in moving to their water supply, and then that gives them more time to consume food that will then uh, help them then either grow larger antlers and be healthier uh, and maintain or gain more body weight. When we start looking at smaller animals, they, you'd like to think that the, that javelina or the fox or skunk of those, they could travel uh, as much as a quarter of a mile to get to water. Uh, but uh, after that, there, we start looking at the other animals there. We know the white tail, I mean the, the wild turkey, is going to be within a quarter of a mile of some water source where they're going to nest. And so having that water supply more often for them is going to expand that area where they can raise their young, feel more protected, and get that water that they need and go back to their nest. Other smaller animals are they need water more often. We get into many of these songbirds or then some of these smaller animals. Uh, they may live within one acre all their life. A bobtail, I mean a bobwhite may then live in uh, eight to uh, 30 acres in majority of their life, even though they may travel further than that. But having it there for them is, is going to then uh, be advantageous for them to be able to have water supply. Well, how much water do they need? And I've just got then numbers from livestock, since that's what I work with majority of my time or have in the past. Uh, and then that, that consumption, looking at one cow, it'd be 7 to 18 gallons. That's a huge variety uh, then are, are extreme uh, from a low to a high. And all that's going to be then really based upon then uh, what they're doing, looking at a cow, is she nursing? Uh, is she then also very hot conditions that she's having to do uh, expire or the sweat so that she can cool herself off? Uh, then also in the wintertime, that amount may be low because that uh, uh, they need less during the wintertime, a lot less evaporation. Then that's uh, the extreme error that uh, we may have those times when it is hot and dry, the food source is very, very dry. They need that extra supplemental water then to provide them for cattle. Same way we go with other species. We start looking down uh, how much is going to be required. Most of the time what we're looking at, we're not going to have these animals in cages, so we're providing supplemental water for them, so it's not as critical that I supply the full need for those species. They've got to be able to get a drink and then feel comfortable, uh, then go back to the other parts of uh, either grazing or, or then resting. Uh, so I may provide some of that, but if I'm looking at a sheep or goat, Basically about two gallons per hundred pounds of body weight is about what they're going to consume uh, on a daily basis. And so it's, again, it's going to vary from one to four gallons for something that size of a white-tailed deer, much, much less when you get into smaller species. Uh, but providing the supplemental water may give them that chance to then get a drink there and then travel on uh, to other parts of their habitat. So most of the time we're just providing supplemental water uh, rather than that full amount that they're going to need for a lifetime. And then I've already mentioned some of the factors here, looking at green forage versus dry forage, looking at temperature where it's very hot, where it's very cold, looking at the humidity there, that they will, uh, it, uh, they may consume lots of water in this very high uh, humidity area versus an area where it's extremely dry. Uh, we expel lots of water just in our breath. And so in those locations there, I may need more water provided for them uh, simply because there is not much humidity.
as we get into the age, the weight, uh, the pregnancy, lactation, looking at those things are all those affect the amount of water they're going to need daily then to supply for their cells as maybe as well as their young. And then maybe even the salt that might be in the water that they're having or then the food supply there. The more salt that they will intake is just going to influence uh, the more water they're going to ingest at the same time. So how, how much water do the wildlife need? Uh, we mentioned there that it may take a lot for many of these species, uh, but the majority of the time we're just going to be providing the supplemental water to them. Uh, that old scissor tail may never need to get a drink. I never see them at my watering device, uh, but I'll see lots of other species there uh, drinking. That uh, cardinal is going to get a drink there regularly because they consume seeds. So it depends on their food source is really how much water they're going to need and how often they need to find a water supply. Now if I provide supplemental water there, uh, then I'm also then increasing the habitat for other species that might be coming there waiting for their food source. And so this is one uh, where this uh, rattlesnake was waiting for this uh, cardinal to come so that it could uh, be his food source. So it's an attractant for then other species. As we look at placing this water device, it's something we want to take into consideration. They've got to feel comfortable being there and knowing that uh, they're not going to be then the uh, target of some predator waiting on them. So as I look at the questions there to see if I need to provide water there, I need to know what sources are currently available for, for them, how far are they actually having to travel, the number and the diversity of species that I have on my wildlife, uh, on my place. Uh, I think of the Bamberger Ranch there west of Johnson City as they have improved uh, the habitat, the water supply, the diversity of plants on their place, the number of uh, of uh, uh, bird species that they've been able to identify has gone way on up and they've doubled, tripled, quadrupled the number and the diversity of, and the number of those species at the same time. So looking at improving the habitat is just going to be one of those things that's also going to then uh, increase the numbers and diversity of uh, species that come there. And so the mobility of those species, when I start looking at that mountain lion, I may then just be a place for him to get a drink at once uh, in a and maybe nearly his lifetime. So it may be that I'm not supplying just giving him a drink as he travels on his long, uh, long journey. Uh, but other species there, I've got to provide it not only at the sites at how far they have to travel, but also in the location, uh, the depth, how close to the soil do they need it, uh, are then raised up uh, so that uh, I can get to my target species in their needs. I've got to think about the rainfall pattern in my location. How long is it going to be dry before I get that next rainfall event? That's going to really dictate how big that root needs to be as well as how big that collection tank needs to be so I can provide water uh, for those species 365 days a year. If I'm out in some regions where it may be dry for one month, two months, three months, uh, having that water for them that length of time is going to be critical. So we'll we'll discuss that a little bit more as we go through here. Uh, but looking at the other thing are the options available for harvesting, storing, and conveying water. Uh, we get into West Texas, going on into then some of the Rocky Mountains there. We may have rock formations that water may rain on there, and we can utilize it to then force water into a storage tank and then provide for them for a long period of time. Others there start looking at I may have a barn or shed or even in my backyard I may have a house that I can utilize in to catch water off of. But in out uh, locations where there's not any other uh, facility to catch off of, I may have to build that roof so that I can provide for them uh, and have that uh, source there. So we have here a couple examples of where a roof has been built to convey that water into that storage tank uh, and then have it available then for wildlife. The bottom left is at uh, Freeman Ranch, part of Texas State University. This is in that 400-acre uh, area, a 20 by 20 roof that we built. There are cattle in that area, so we put a fence around it so that the cattle would not get in. But wildlife could easily either go under or go over there to provide for them. In the top picture, uh, not only is this a, a place to provide food, but also to provide water. So this may be an attractant uh, for then some hunters. Uh, in the state of Texas, other lo or it may be a place where we can uh, uh, then photograph animals if that's not uh, the way that we're doing it. So providing water at these locations is a way that uh, may keep us busy during the daytime while I'm sitting in that deer blind. Uh, I can see the other wildlife species go there, get a drink of water, where there might not be anything else uh, 
going on sites listening to some of the football games that might be on the radio. And so uh, start looking at the first, I want to go back and then really talk about habitats. I've got to have a habitat for them to be there. If just providing water may not be all that's needed. So this is a location that's close to me. This is a, a grade school, junior high, where there's basically zero habitat for anything to live there. There's just nothing there for them. No cover, no food, no shelter. Uh, and then no water supply. And so we're going to take this and then build this into uh, an area that might be acceptable for certain wildlife species. We're using those rocks. We saw where the kids were walking, made them permeable paving out of then granite, uh, decomposed granite, use those rocks to build a border with that. And then we start putting plants in here. We put in some rain gardens so that they would uh, capture that water when it comes off the roof and then expand that area there from one end of the building to the other, trying to add a diversity of plants uh, in this uh, process. And then as we get into the final farm, after it's got, had a year to grow, we see the diversity that's there now. The kids would walk through here, there's butterflies, there's hummingbirds that's coming through there. They see the different insects that are there. And so we can create habitat uh, by just the things that we do in our backyard or in our back party that we may be providing water for. Uh, the different species. But habitat's very important uh, for any of the species that we're looking at and try and provide the cover, the food, uh, water, and then hopefully then the space as well that's for the target species we're working off of. So the last thing there, and I'm going to need to back up uh, in saying that every drop of water is important. And I'd like to say that every drop that falls on your place is critical. You make that decision where it's going to go. Is it going to run off or is it going to stay on that site? So think about then passive way of collection. I've got to have water to grow plants. I've got to have that to be able to get water into the ground. So all that's very critical to take care of my wildlife species. So think about the full habitat in the process. And so I can capture water off the top of the mountain. I can capture it then in the low valleys as well. Uh, this is one that one of the early farms has put in where they had a concrete apron funnel water into a 3,000 gallon collection tank that's down below ground. Uh, then there's just an opening where so while I can walk into there as water level goes down, uh, then they can walk further in there to get to that water supply. There are companies now that provide something similar to this here uh, out of fiberglass that might be available and can be used. The places that I'm going to go in the Sandia Mountains, they have one similar to this already right up next to the mountain, which is one water supply source they have. But uh, we're going to be putting them in much further away than this here. This is one I mentioned earlier, one of the more other farms that we can do where I can build that metal roof a lot cheaper. This can be a flat roof, that's just a shed roof that's sloped to one, out, one end, or it can be sort of a wing shape that I would funnel water to the center, uh, then run into the storage tank. It makes no difference on which direction that I would go with that. And I can have my own roof that just runs straight into that collection tank. This is one at the, uh, out in West Texas at the Chihuahua Desert Research Institute where this uh, roof then funnels water into about a thousand gallon tank and then off to the side about uh, 30 yards is this water device that was really designed for horses. It has a float that's protected. It's all in concrete so it cannot be torn up near as easy. But then it's just from gravity flow to this side. And so we can provide animals uh, water at this location. These are some pictures that was taken there by a motion sensor camera. Just give you an idea of the different species that would come to that site. Uh, and utilize that water supply. This is one I showed earlier there at the premium rates that would funnel water into that storage tank. They, they saw that uh, they were not utilizing enough water, so that was overflowing. Uh, so then they could add another storage tank and then add another water supply out closer to a tree or to another shrub uh, to provide then additional watering for then other species of wildlife that might not feel as comfortable going underneath that shed. But going back to a simple one that I have, this is one I have in my house, the roof is six foot by eight foot. Now for every one square foot, one inch of rain, yields six tenths of a gallon of water. One square foot, one inch of rain, six tenths of a gallon of water. So this in here is six foot by eight, we can multiply that six by eight is 48 square foot. I've got a wide gutter to make it 50 square feet. So if it rains one inch off a of 50 square foot, 50 times 0.6 is going to be 30 gallons that's going to come off that roof. And so I've got a 300 gallon collection tank, uh, so it's going to take 10 inches to fill it up. Now it's going to go to a bird bath that's going to drip about one drop per second. 
Uh, so in that process there, I want to know how much water is going to take then to provide for a birth bath, bird bath that drips a drop a second uh, and, and provide for them. Uh, so I've already gone through this here, so I'm going to go, hopefully I'll go to the next number here uh, that's going to ask you then how much it is. And so get that ideal. This is in uh, El Paso, Texas. It's at the desalinization uh, uh, plant that's there. Uh, I'm going to, that's an educational facility that you have in, in the front of that, the Tech H2O facility. I'm going to put a 1,500 gallon collection tank here. It's going to be catching off one downspout uh, going into this 1,500 gallon tank. I'm going to have it where it's going to go down from that uh, root drain underground and rise back up to go into this collection tank. Uh, it's a black poly tank to begin with. Uh, then I'm going to run across and it's going to go from this uh, primary root drain on the left side. Go across where it's going to go at this step so nobody trip over that pipe. Go underground, uh, then rise back up to go into the collection tank. Uh, from there it's going to go into the top of it. Uh, and then an overflow that's going to go through that dry stream bed into this uh, dry uh, rain garden that's at this location. Now when I was, uh, this is sort of the finished picture from this side, uh, as I was putting a wood covering around it, I just put some ropes around it and start sliding these wood slats in it. But as I was doing this, it, it started to rain. This is November a year ago, so it's about a year and a half ago uh, there in El Paso. I gathered up my tools, started to drive away. But I came back to take some pictures of it, and so this is the, during the rain that you can see water running uh, there on the ground all around this facility. Uh, then it, it was gone just about as quick as it came, about a 10-minute downpour. So I went around to the other side to see where water was coming out that primary downspout, uh, then went back to the side where I caught this water, put it into this collection tank. Now we have six tenths of an inch of rain during that little downpour. I caught 800 gallons of water off this one root drain. But as I did this, uh, the rain was over, I drove away, and what do people do? We send all of our water off of our roofs, out of our yards, straight into the streets, off, get it into the river as fast as we can, and so that we can uh, then buy municipal water or take water out of our well. We've got to figure out how to capture this water and utilize this. And so if I've got this going to a bird bath, it's going to drip a drop a second. I need to know about how many drops are in a gallon of water. And so the first thing there, there's about 90,400 drops in one gallon of water. So if it drips about one drop a second, I need to know about how many seconds are in a day. And so in a 24-hour day, there's 86,400 seconds, which means if I drip about one drop a second, then I have a, provided then one gallon per day to provide for this bird bath that I'm going to utilize. And so this is what I built there. Uh, you can't hardly see it, but there's a tree right next to the side of this. I've been there back at uh, different times. Uh, there's uh, different birds that are coming there. They tell me that there's a coyote there with our cubs or our, our kids that come there regularly there. They see them now. And so that if I drip a drop a second, which means I use a gallon a day, I call from that one shower 800 gallons, which means I've got 800 days of water for this one bird bath. So I can add more than that. So it doesn't take very much, even of a small roof, then provide for wildlife. Now there's two ways to get water into that tank. One is just let that water run straight into it from off the roof, which I'd call a dry line, and I like that. But if I have then a roof in one location, say if I got my deer blind, but I want to put that water uh, storage tank over there closer to where I might have my uh, feed supply, I can let that water line go down underground or above ground if I want to go across and put that storage tank right where I want it to be. Uh, this may or may not be a challenge for you, but it's simple and easy to do. That I can let that water go down, go across, and then rise up to go into that storage tank. I capture off my house four down spouts. I've got 3,000 square foot of roof. Uh, those go down underground with a one four inch line goes all the way across about uh, 50 yards, goes, rises up to go in top of my storage tank. And I have about 18, difference, 18 inches difference in elevation from my bottom of gutter to where it goes in that tank. And there's enough pressure and force of that that it will move that water over and then gives me that ability to put that storage tank in a place that might be under the tree, then might be shaded, give me more cover if I want it to be where it's going to be cooler all the time. Then I can provide that water then for then wildlife in a number of different ways in that process. This is just a little simple bird bath that I have uh, at a house there in Menard, Texas, where I live. Uh, giving you that idea of then moving that water through its wet line. Uh, this is a, uh, where that water's off of a 10 by 10 roof going down underground 
going out to where their vegetable garden is, and this could also be for a wildlife device, let that water go down, go across there, and go up and go into that rain barrel. But I can have it just run straight into then my uh, small rain barrel just as a dry line like we see here where I've got two pieces of tin uh, built on a small frame so that water would go into that barrel. And then we can build a little concrete water device. This is one that's provided more for a backyard or for them for birds. For uh, This is a copper tubing with a drip irrigation tubing going inside it. A drip emitter on the end of that provides them for wildlife species. So this is one uh, that we, we put in a couple of different locations. You can see in the foreground uh, that concrete watering device has been uh, buried a little bit. Uh, right in the center is a float uh, watering pan then for wildlife. And so uh, these are some pictures of then the wildlife coming, the deer. One of those bottom left picture and at top left is a raccoon and a deer trying to discuss who's going to get that first drink of water. But it will then and provide then for wildlife species during the day or during night. So this is close to Lavaca uh, County uh, in uh, southeast Texas uh, where a number of different uh, deer are coming there and then and getting that drink of water. So it is used a good way then to provide then uh, an attractant for wildlife. I put here on here the design that I use for this very simple one. Uh, the, the drier that it is, the less uh, rain that I get, the bigger this roof needs to be. So I can expand this on out so it gets much bigger. Uh, this is a 30 gallon collection tank underneath here that could easily be 50 or I could tie two or three of those together to give me more storage. Uh, one of the things here, this is low to the ground. Uh, that tank is sitting on then the frame. If I get a high wind, uh, if that frame didn't have something to really hold it down or stake down there, uh, then it might blow over. And mine has done that before. So having then this water sit on that then gives me that extra weight uh, to hold that frame down. And then we can build our wildlife device, watering device. This is where I do this with a master naturalist where they'll make a concrete uh, uh, then conveyance or then a container to really concave so that uh, it will hold water uh, then be able to hook this up to then the bird bath uh, or to the, to the tank. So this is sort of that skip, uh, sketch of how this works uh, where we can make that. Uh, so uh, something that I like to do with master gardeners, master naturalists, and with kids as well. And then I can build something bigger. This is one that I build with no plow disc so that it can set up. Uh, they were wanting this ready for deer at this location and not necessarily trying to address the needs for then other species, uh, but gives us more capacity. We can build uh, this with recycled containers, and uh, this is something that uh, gives good use to them as well as work excellent uh, then for our wildlife. Uh, making sure that these are then thick enough that sunlight will not get in. Uh, tough enough then, it's not going to hurt them for this tank to freeze or then this by gravity flow uh, freezing at all. Uh, so we can build from a rain barrel. I can make uh, this easily. I can put my own faucet. Uh, many of these will have then a couple of holes at the end that I could screw a faucet into. Uh, if not, I could drill a hole into it at the bottom about a one inch diameter hole and that will fit a three-quarter inch faucet. It will screw in there. I like to use a brass faucet. Uh, it will cut threads and it will not hardly leak uh, at all and may never leak. And most of those will not leak. Uh, there are other containers out there. This is one that's been utilized uh, east of Dallas uh, primarily for chickens and guineas uh, and ducks, but it could easily be done for any wildlife species as well. Uh, those containers, if we call those shuttles, that's been used once by some other uh, product uh, that uh, makes sure that's not a chemical that's hazardous or any pesticide. They're not UV light resistance. They're very thin and they will break down. But if I will paint them and give them that protection and use that, uh, it will be a cheap source of water then for certain locations. Uh, I know I'm uh, behind on time, so I'm talking a little bit faster. But uh, looking at uh, this is one at the Kerr Wildlife Management Area. I put in a 1,500 gallon tank that's off of one of their maintenance facilities right next to where their median room has been. Uh, we run a pipeline down. This is where they're building a concrete uh, water trough then to actually hold the water for uh, wildlife. So they set this in place, put the farms in it, uh, brought in concrete, poured it in place. And so then this is a finished end. At the deep end, it's about two foot deep. On the shallower end, it just goes all the way down to nothing. 
there's a float device that's right at that deeper end. So wildlife is going to have to go out there. That raccoon is going to have to reach way out there to be able to fiddle with this uh, float device. But uh, uh, it's been there for a number of years now. Been very very successful. Uh, we can then add the plants to it to re create then a real nice wildlife habitat, provide the food uh, then for all species to come there. And it uh, has uh, attracted lots of frogs, so that includes that increases in uh, the food source for other species to come there as well. And so, in the, finally, in the top left picture, you can see that this is a Texas wildscape habitat. Uh, and right behind it, there's a deer that, uh, when I came here early one morning, uh, I, I scared it off of the water, and it's back there watching me and wanting me to leave so it can go back to get a drink. So it can be very successful in then providing then for wildlife. This is another example of a very small one. This is all out of metal where it tapers to the middle and runs into a storage tank. One of the very first ones I built probably close to 15 years ago. Uh, with a gentleman that was at the Freeman Ranch uh, at Texas State University. Much larger one down closer to uh, uh, the uh, Rio Grande River, uh, out in uh, closer to uh, uh, along, the, along the big rush area. I can't even think of the city now. But uh, uh, bottom left, uh, before, once we got it put in, then after we get rain in there, uh, providing this is that uh, bat wing sort of shape to funnel water into this storage tank. Uh, this is a bird bath that I used in my house from that uh, first one you saw, that six by eight foot roof uh, running down. This runs down about uh, through half inch poly pipe, about uh, 50 yards, then runs, uh, this little tube runs up then through that stump, then drips into the top, then this uh, drips over to the side. The picture on the right is just one that uh, I've constructed and used in, in another location. Uh, these are a couple of other examples. I like it at two locations. There's birds that like to be at the top. And wildlife like to drink from the top, and others like to drink from that bottom. So it increases in uh, the diversity of animals that would come to that. So I took some pictures of mine at my house. Uh, uh, this is a bird that's enjoying that shallow pan and that dripping water uh, provide. And so it's a oh, orchard oriole is there and, and gets to utilize that. Uh, here's uh, three different birds that are uh, drinking from our really that uh, mockingbirds uh, telling these other two birds are in his habitat. But that uh, male brown-headed cowbird, the Scots Oriole, there all at one time uh, get in that water. And so I've seen species that I didn't recognize as being in my area uh, have come to that and been able to enjoy those over time. And it's a fun to watch these different species. And you'll see that drop form in here. This is an adjustable drip emitter. Uh, and, and this, uh, uh, and I'm not positive, but I think it's a crown kinglet that, uh, that sees that drop form. And the next thing it's going to do is going to catch that drop before it ever falls. Uh, then it goes back up, swallows that, then it waits for that next drop to come down. So it's been fun to watch the different species come there and enjoy that. This is one that I built, found a little rock that's sort of concave, uh, done the same thing with it, have then copper tubing that comes up and around and drips, then provide them for the birds at this location there. And then even just providing its base. I get a number of different species that can come to that, uh, providing them for different species to be able to utilize this. This is one that was designed for quail. I just uh, made it a little bit more attractive, uh, not for them, but for then for me, that more than anything else in those locations. Another one there, got to figure out exactly where I want to put that so that it will be then convenient. The species come out, feel safe to be able to utilize that uh, over time in there. So things I need to consider. As uh, long as there's nothing under pressure, this can continue to drift. This mine where it'll freeze there in, at night, it's gotten down to five degrees before. Uh, nothing's ever busted. This is just freeze. Then once that the sun gets there, it thaws out, and it just starts again, uh, dripping again. So I've never had a concern, never had a problem on this here in the last 10 years that I've utilized this here. Now, the storage tank is not going to hurt it to freeze there. Unless I get into a smaller rain barrel, it may freeze solid. But most of these here where they've got lots of water in there, uh, even in Kansas where there was one there that was a uh, uh, 1,500 gallons on a trailer. It was down below zero for over a week. They had ice that was about eight to ten inches thick. Uh, they had a heat tape on it where they were providing for livestock. Uh, never froze. They always had water for those animals there all the time. So it's not going to hurt the tank, uh, but the, all the things coming out of there, if they're under pressure, they're certainly going to going to freeze. Now I need to provide that water right where the species are, and they like to hear that sound of dripping water, and it really will entice them to come to that. Things I want to make sure that I don't drown any species that might fall in there, that water's not deep enough. The one on the left I don't like is too big, that water is stagnant, it's not turning over uh, enough, uh, then it turns into a habitat then for mosquitoes. There's not any dripping water. I like that dripping water just to break that uh, 
surface so that mosquitoes not attracted to that site. But I've got to have a way to get those, those animals out of there. One on the right there, where I have some rocks in it that uh, then birds will come to that. This is one of the world birding centers. Uh, the birds will come there, light on that, get a drink. They also have some little uh, spaces there that they can uh, easily uh, get into and get out of and then to take a bath with. I want to protect it so that it's not then torn up by feral hogs or other things, so making sure that it's not going to be destructive uh, or torn up. Provide it where they feel safe. And the, these quails that's underneath here, they feel safe then from uh, those hawks or other predators that might get to them. The other thing is think about that storage tank. I want to make sure that it is not a habitat for mosquitoes. Make sure that my collection tank is in mosquito tight uh, and so that they will not get in there. If it's where it will not work, I can put mosquito ducts in there that will kill those larvae uh, as an option. Also, don't want light to get any storage tank, because so that's going to clog up any drip emitters uh, off of that. So think of the ways that I keep the light out. It may be that tank need, just needs to be painted. And I'm not concerned what color, but just so the light will not get in. So that algae, I may just let it go if it's in an open tank. I can clean it out and rinse it maybe with ammonia if I want to. But it's going to be a problem uh, if I have sunlight getting into there. So there's examples all across the state when we start looking at Texas Parks and Wildlife. They're putting it in, in, in a number of locations that are provide for wildlife and then provide things that they're used to. Flooding that area there on the border really then takes care of those neotropical birds much more than otherwise. This is one I catch off of a thousand gallon tank off of a school built by all bird bass was dripping into that location there over time. But think about the bigger tanks uh, where I may have more exposure to evaporation, especially in drier climates. It, I may lose a lot of water evaporation. But think about the species I'm trying to provide for. How many of them are going to be there at one time? I get a flock of turkeys. They may want a large area so more of them can get a drink at the same time. And so for others, it may, we're all trying to do to create a habitat that's going to be acceptable, enjoyable uh, for us and for them. So think of things that you can do, whether it's in your backyard, or then a much larger area. I'd like to finish just with my house, just giving an example of then what we could do at our location. Model map picture is my sort of my type of landscaping in the front yard. Uh, this is looking out my uh, kitchen window where I like uh, animals to come there and enjoy my location. I enjoy watching them. This is my backyard as well. Uh, then I then I have my bird bath right out the side where I can watch a number of species come to there. Uh, and uh, so think about your home, making it a place in for all species, our uh, habitat for them the best that we can. Teddy Roosevelt said right at 100 years ago, a nation behaves well if it treats those natural resources as an asset. We've got to turn over to the next generation, increased and not impaired in value. We've done lots of destruction to habitat. We need to, as this generation, then to recreate that and improve that. So rainwater is one of the ways that we can do that, providing for the habitat, making it enjoyable for them and certainly enjoyable for us as well. I'm going to do a workshop in, in just north of Albuquerque on October 22 to 24. Uh, there's information on that that uh, I can provide to you, but uh, Timothy Smith that works there at that uh, Pueblo, uh, this is his phone number. The cost for that is going to be two and a half days. The first day we're going to get in some basics, build a rain barrel for then uh, a small species. The second day we're going to build a larger one on one of the Sandia Mountains right at the base of it for the pronghorn uh, sheep, pronghorn antelope, uh, deer, and other species. And the third day we will build two more on up uh, closer to the mountain, the base of the mountain. It should be a prime time to go. Enjoy seeing lots of different wildlife species in that area. So. Uh, call Timothy if you're interested in that. I think he's taking 40 people uh, to go through this workshop. So uh, I'll be there. I invite you to come there and be a part of it if you'd like to. Lastly, there's some resources out there. Certainly, then the Wildlife Association has those resources. Texas Parks and Wildlife, as well as Extension Service, that uh, uh, we would be able to provide you if you're interested in some other things on then uh, rainwater harvesting for wildlife species. So with that, I thank you for your time. I apologize again for getting on late with you, but uh, this is my uh, email address. You're certainly welcome to email me at any time. I've been working with Extension Service. I'm about to retire full time and get off of their uh, mailing list or off of their website. I'll never get off their mailing list. But uh, anyway, if I can help you in a way, uh, please call me. Uh, I'd be glad to help you and work with you in any way I can. 
So with that, I thank you very, very much with your time. Uh, are there any questions that anyone has that I can respond to? Billy, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, folks, if you've got any questions, feel free to type them into that chat window right now and send to all participants. We do have one question. Uh, David would like to know where you would recommend uh, getting detailed designs for uh, rainwater catchment systems. There was an old booklet that was put together by, uh, I think, then uh, one of the USDA uh, uh, now called Natural Resource Conservation Service that uh, was put together. Uh, it went out of date, was not redone. Texas Parks and Wildlife put one together very similar. And so the Extension Service uh, about five years ago then combined those into one that gave lots of uh, different uh, sketches of different uh, ways of collect water, different uh, types of water devices that are out there. So it's on our uh, extension service uh, bookstore or you can go to my website which is rainwaterharvesting.tamu.edu that's right in the middle of this here uh, that it's you can get it from that uh, find it on that website this is mine there's lots of videos some of them are on walleye I'm, I'm making some more videos that'll be on that website but that rainwaterharvesting.tamu.edu will be a good resource from the extension service to provide booklets as well as in uh, some videos that you might look at. Excellent. And it looks like we haven't gotten any other questions in, so maybe we managed to get them answered. Okay. Um, so folks, if you are um, looking for CEU credit, just a reminder that you're going to get a, um, a survey that pops up here when we close out of the window, and make sure you complete that survey um, to get your CEU credit. And um, other than that, Billy, I can't thank you enough. Um, on behalf of TWA and AgriLife Extension, we really appreciate you doing this presentation for us. And um, folks, from uh, from here on out, we'll have this one archived on the TWA website. Um, and you can go at any time and review this or other uh, webinars that we've had in the Wildlife for Lunch series. And uh, there's the link for that specific section on the TWA website. Our next uh, Wildlife for Lunch webinar will be September 20th, and we're going to have Dave Hewitt talking about uh, deer nutritional requirements and implications for management. So um, feel free to join us then. Let's see, we've got one more question. It says, uh, from Joanna, can these techniques be used for livestock too? Uh, yes, they can be used for livestock. And uh, we have on that same website a publication on rainwater harvesting for livestock and wildlife. I also have then a four series video, not a, a training course that uh, uh, you could take if you really want to get in depth in that. Uh, the first half of that is for livestock, looking at then alternatives and providing. The thing that uh, when you start looking at, wild, at livestock species, our cow is going to need around 15 gallons per day. If I have very many, it's just going to take a lot of water. Uh, there is a location uh, by Brownwood where he has 18 horses. Uh, rainwater is his sole supply for those 18 horses. Uh, it is done for sheep and goats. It can be then utilized in small locations where then I want to keep uh, animals in a trap for a short time. One of the things that I didn't uh, that you might think about is that uh, through the USDA, one of the equip programs is in uh, they will cost share some of these wildlife devices uh, in West Texas. They will also then cost share some of these in other locations, catching off of a barn so to reduce then the amount of pollution from manure that would go into some of our riparian ways. And so there is some cost share possibly for that and utilizing that for the livestock. Many of these old barns may have then a windmill and a large concrete watering device. I can capture off this barn and put into that concrete just to help that windmill out during certain times of the year. So that's done as well as in uh, utilizing this strictly for livestock or wildlife. Excellent, thank you. Um, it looks like that's about all the questions we've got. So, uh, Billy, I'm just going to say thanks again, and we really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully, we'll see everyone back for next month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. And uh, thanks to all those who participated. Y'all have a great day. Thank you all. Goodbye.